around talking about romance, reality, and redemption. But in like fashion, we have a video to introduce today, so, so please, turn your attention. So it seemed that it was cool for everyone to be in a relationship but me. <laughs> so I took matters into my own hands and ended up with him. Display the characteristics of a cheater, a liar, an abuser, and a thief. So why was I surprised when he broke into my heart? I called 911, but I was cardiac arrested for aiding and abetting because it was me who let him in, claiming we were just friends. It was already decided for me by the first date that even if he wasn't, I was going to make him the one. You know, I was tired of being alone and I simply made up in my mind that it was about that time so I decided to drag him along for the ride because I was always the bridesmaid and never the bride. A uh, virgin in the physical but mentally just a grown woman on the corner and he was tired of the wait. So I was going to make him the one. He had a form of godliness but not much. <laughs> But, but, but hey, hey, I can change him, so I'll take him. I mean, he's close enough. <laughs> Ready to sell my aorta for a quarter, not knowing the value of its use to me. Arteries so clogged with my will, it blocked his will from flowing through me. So I thank Christ that his blood pressure gave this heart an attack that flatlined my obscured vision, put me flat on my back. Through my ignorance, he saw. So through my sternum, he saw it and cracked open my chest to transplant Psalms 5110. A new heart and a renewed right spirit within. So now I fully understand, better yet, I thoroughly comprehend how much I need to wait for you. See, the bad thing is that I knew he was in you from the beginning. Because in the beginning was the word and he didn't even sound or shine like your son. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks and all he could whisper was sweet, empty nothings. Which meant nothing. He couldn't even pray what I needed him to. Asking him to fast would be absurd, so forget about being cleansed and washed with water through the word. But I know you. You are already praying for me. Even never having met me, let me assure you, I will wait for you. I will no longer date, socialize, or communicate with carbon copies of you to appease my boredom or to quench my thirsty desire for attention and short-lived compliments from sorta of kindness. You know he's sorta of kinda right, but sorta of kinda wrong. His first name Luke, his last name Warm. I won't settle for false companionship. I won't lay in the embrace of his arms, attempting to find some closeness, but never feeling so apart, far apart, because I just want to be held. Because all I got to do is say no. No more almost sessions of almost coming close, passing winks and buying drinks, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a flirt who flirts with the ideology of, can you just tell me how much I can get away with and still be saved? No more. I'll stay in my bed, alone, and write poems about how I will wait for you. He won't even come close. Our fingers won't even interlock. We won't even exchange breath. Cause I have thoughts that I've saved as and a father God has only equipped you to open. I will no longer get rated down from so-called friends and family talks about the concern for my biological clock when I serve the author of time. subject to time but I'm subject to him he has the ability to stop fast forward pause or rewind at any given time so if we could role play you would be Abraham and I would be Sarah <laughs> or you could be Isaac and I could be Rebecca a servant's answer to prayer I am bone of your bone flesh of your flesh made up of your rib Adam and once we meet 
like electrons that will be bound to your nucleus, completely indivisible atom. We even speak the same math. One plus one plus one equals three, which really equals one if you add them. We were all created in his image, but you have the ability to reflect, project, and even detect the sun. If I were to explain what you look like, you would have to look like a star, a son of the sun. I would gain energy simply from the light that you shine on me. I would need you in order to complete my photosynthesis. I await your revelation, but once again from the Genesis, I will wait for you. And I will know you, because when you speak, I will be reminded of Solomon's wisdom. Your ability to lead will remind me of Moses. Your faith will remind me of Abraham. Your confidence in God's word will remind me of Daniel. Your inspiration will remind me of Paul. Your heart for God will remind me of David. Your attention to detail will remind me of Noah. Your integrity will remind me of Joseph. And your ability to abandon your own will will remind me of the disciples. But your ability to love selflessly and unconditionally will remind me of Christ. <laughs> But I won't need to identify you by any special Matthews or any special marks because this word will be tatted all over your heart. And you will know me and you will find me where the boldness of Esther meets the warm closeness of Ruth where the hospitality of Lydia is aligned with the submission of Mary which is engulfed in the tears of a praying Hannah I will be the one drenched in Proverbs 31 waiting for you but to my father my father who has known me before I was birthed into this earth only if you should see fit I desire your will above mine, so even if you call me to a life of singleness, my heart is content with you, the one who has sinned. You are the greatest love story ever told, the greatest love ever known. You are forever my judge, and I'm forever your witness. And I pray that I'm always found on a mission about my father's business. I will always be yours, and I will always wait for you, Lord, more than the watchmen wait for the morning. More than the watchmen wait for the morning, I will wait. Amen. Let's pray. Okay. <laughs> God, we are attuned to you now. We're asking that you come on each of us individually and collectively as your people. That as you desire to speak, God, we have a desire to hear. So God, let us meet in the middle, receiving from you as you impart to us God, that we may be loved by you today and changed. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 That sister is um, pretty gifted. <laughs> yeah, she's pretty gifted. So when I was growing up um, as a girl in school, we used to play this game called Match. Yes. Some of y'all know about Match, yes. right? <laughs> and Match was played by boys and girls alike. Okay, not just the sisters. So MASH stands for mansion, apartment, shack, or house, right? And you put them across and then you, you write other things. So this line right here are people that I might marry. So you know, I put my husband's name up here, of course. <laughs> and then I put, you know, just really safe people, Batman, Superman, Nelson Mandela. <laughs> then how many kids you might have? Zero, one, two, three. Where you might live, Raleigh, San Leandro, Chicago, New York. What I might do, pastor, CEO, actress, professor, what kind of car I might drive, Acura, BMW, Hoopty, Audi. You gotta have a little, little reality. <laughs> right? It's not fun if you don't, if you, you know, if you don't have a little reality. So then you choose a number and you start to count down and you mark out. So I chose the number three. So you count down one, two, three, starting to mark. One, two, three. Until you get just one thing left in each row. So according to this game, I'm supposed to be living in a mansion with my husband, Nelson Mandela, with three kids living in Chicago as the CEO of a company driving an Audi. I'm married to Dedrick. <laughs> living in a house in San Leandro with one daughter. I'm a pastor. I drive a very old Africa. Amen, Brother Fred, help me. Hook up that old Africa. <laughs> But we think about this as a kid's game. It's what we play, right? What would we be? What would we do? Who would we marry? 
right? Dreaming. But there is something that in this that we do too as adults. How often do we say, I want to be married by age 24, or I don't want to get married before I'm 40? How often do we think about, oh, well, I want that kind of house, and I want a job that makes this specific salary. I want 2.3 kids, and a pink fits around my house. I want to drive a BMW, right? And it's okay to dream, but when we romanticize our futures, right? When we romanticize these kind of relationships, it doesn't leave room for the harsh realities when they set in that cause us disappointment, right? When you first meet someone, you're on this love drug, right? You physically have some stuff going on in your brain that makes you feel like you are euphoric, you're on cloud nine. And scientists say that this, this can last up to two years, but then when that wears out, what you gonna do? <laughs> right? So today we're just gonna talk about some of the more foundational stuff that is necessary for both single people and married people, I think, to understand in terms of being sustainable in healthy relationship as it relates to God. So in our passage today, we find the messiness of this, what it means to wait for love, and the messiness of what it means to be in a loving relationship that just sometimes disappoints, right? Jesus is on his way to Galilee. He has to come through Samaria, and he stops at Jacob's well, right? It's the heat of the day, it's like noon. He sends his disciples into town to get water. But he's at this well called Jacob's Well. And Jacob's Well, to me, is very interesting that it is attached to this particular passage. For those of you who don't know Jacob, Jacob is the son of Isaac and the grandson of Abraham. And if you don't know his story, it's found in Genesis chapters 25 through 36. Go back and read it. All right? I always encourage you both to read the stories. All right? So... But Jacob had a very interesting love life. That's why I think seeing Jacob appear in this passage in any form or fashion alludes to something, right? So Jacob first met the love of his life at a well, not this particular well, <laughs> but at a well. He comes to Haran, he sees the love of his life named Rachel, and he wants to marry her, but he has to wait and work for seven years before he can marry this woman that he's in love with. He waits and works for seven years only to be deceived into marrying her sister Leah. He has to wait another seven years in order to marry Rachel. He does that. And now he's in the mess, right, the messiness of love and relationships between a woman that he loves dearly and a woman that he loves not quite so much and all the stuff that comes with it. It's some messy stuff. His love life is messy. And yet here Jesus comes to this well, and it's Jacob's well, which is not the same well where he met Rachel, but still, the connection is unavoidable. And he sits down to rest, the disciples go and get food, and here comes the Samaritan woman with her water jar and bucket. She approaches the well, and he says to her, give me a drink of water. Now she's surprised by this, not because he asked for a drink, but because there are some real racial and cultural differences between her and Jesus. Jesus is a Jew. She's is a Samaritan. They don't get along, right? They don't really like each other, right? Jews consider themselves better than Samaritans, generally speaking. So it's really odd for her, for him to be asking for a drink. What's also odd is that she is traveling here in the middle of the day, but most people wait until the sun goes down and come to the well. It's also odd that she passed several streams of water to get to this well more than likely. Right? But either way, I don't think it's a coincidence that she's here. Why? Because Jesus is there. Where Jesus is, there is redemption. Have you ever gone somewhere and unexpectedly found that Jesus was there waiting for you? So she's there. And she's wondering why this Jew is asking her for a drink of water. And she says, why are you asking for a drink of water? You are a Jew. Jesus says to her, well... If you knew who I was and who you were talking to, you would ask me for living water. Yeah. Living water? How, how are you going to get water? You don't have a bucket. This well is really deep. No. The water in this well will make you thirsty again. Yeah. But the water that I have, you will never have to thirst anymore. Oh, really? I want some. 
Can I have some more? Go get your husband. Tell him to come. I don't have a husband. You're right. You don't have a husband. You had five husbands, and the one that you have now isn't your husband. What? You a prophet? <laughs> I'm telling you, there is going to be a time, and that time is now. For God is seeking for people to truly worship him in spirit and in truth. Yeah, I know the Messiah is coming and he's going to know everything about everything. I am the Messiah. She goes into town and she proclaims the good news that she has encountered this man who knows everything and she thinks that he is the Messiah and people come to see Jesus. So there's several things in this interaction, in this woman's life, and how Jesus interacts with her, and the conversation that he has with her that I feel like we can glean as a foundation, right? And what is overarching in all of this is, do we believe that Jesus can do what Jesus says he can? So the very first thing that I feel like God is challenging us in this passage around is, do we believe that God is enough, regardless of whether we're in a romantic relationship or not? Do we believe that God is enough? Jesus is interacting with this woman. And she first says to him when he mentions living water, how are you going to get the water out of the well is to be. She immediately places her own limitations on Jesus. Right? Now, water in the, in the Bible is symbolic of the deepest or the satisfaction of our deepest human need, right? And so Jesus is saying, I'm giving you living water. And she's saying, I don't see how you're going to give me living water when you ain't even got a bucket. And how often, now we know that she's asking this question because she doesn't know who Jesus is, but how often do we fail to believe that Jesus will fulfill his promises because we can't see him fulfilling them any way other than how we know to do it? Jesus is trying to do something completely different from what we're used to. And because we can't figure out how Jesus is going to do it differently, we just wonder and question whether or not it's possible. Is God enough? Right? A couple of years ago, I was trying to make my grandma's cream cheese pound cake. You know, I got my list of ingredients and I went to the store and I bought everything. And I got to the ingredient that said plain flour, like all-purpose flour. And so I was looking at the different choices of flowers, and I saw biscuit, right? And I said, well, I think biscuit would be a whole lot better than some regular old plain flour. It's just going to make my cake better, right? So I bought biscuit, I went home, and I meticulously followed this recipe beautifully. I mean, I take my time, like measuring out, you know, too much salt, uh-oh, uh-oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> right? Get it all mixed up, it smells good, you know, batter tastes good, you gotta taste the batter. <laughs> Put it in the oven, half an hour in, it looks good, it smells good, and then it just keeps rising and rising <laughs> and rising all outside of the cake plate, right? And so I'm upset and I'm mad, and I call my daddy, because my daddy was cook in the family, and I said, Daddy, look, I've been trying to cook this pound cake, and it just doesn't work. And he said, well, did you follow the recipe? I said, yes, I followed the recipe. He says, okay, well, did you use plain flour? I said, um, I used biscuit. <laughs> he said, and did you put salt in it? I said, the recipe called for salt, Daddy. He said, yeah, but the recipe also called for plain flour. <laughs> he says, when you use biscuit, you can't add salt because it's too much. It already has the salt in it, right? And so here I am thinking that something is better, yeah. right? When all I needed was the plain old original regular stuff. Right? And not only did I not have a cake, but I had to clean up a whole lot of mess out of that stove. <laughs> right? And how like this we are. Right? Jesus is interacting with this woman, and, he, and the first thing he says to her when she asks for what? Is he calls attention to the areas in her life where she has, trying, she has been trying to remedy her thirst in ways that have failed. Yeah. The first thing he says to her is, go get your husband. He knows she ain't got no husband. <laughs> right? Because he wanted to call attention to the fact that you are trying to feel a need or a thirst that cannot be filled in the way that you're wanting. Amen. He was saying to her, this quick Joe back home can't do for you with this plain old original flower. <laughs> 
about your intentions or someone else's intentions, make sure somebody is discipling you. If you're single, you need to connect with someone, an elder, someone older, someone who understands being both married and single, right? Who can just, you can bounce stuff off of. If you're married, I always am an advocate for married people having couples in their life, right? Who've been down this road, who can help them, who can nurture them, and who can guide them. You gotta have accountability. Now some dating people can be at home and they can watch a movie and be fine. Other folks can't, you gotta know your limitations. Right? But either way, he's saying there is an appropriateness that exists in relationships. And if you aren't careful and if you are not accountable, you will cross lines every time. And it will just be a mess. Now, some of us I know have been searching and wanting a relationship. This woman, it, clearly, she has a deep want for a relationship. Right? She has a deep need for it. And some of us have been waiting very patiently and very well, and it's a very painful thing sometimes. Right? Then there are others of us who are married and who are in relationships and, and we feel deficits in our relationship, like our relationships are missing something. And if we're not careful on any other way, when we feel a lack, we will seek to go out in order to find it. That has to be a trigger. So that means we might have to start learning how to uh, manage our disappointments a little better. Not allowing the deficits in our relationships and in our life to consume us to the point where we cannot see the surplus. Right? So if you're a person who runs stuff over and over and over again in your head, put a limit on that. I'm going to run this up in my head about an hour. <laughs> then I'm going to journal and I'm going to pray, Lord, please make you enough for me. Yeah. If you're a guy and you put this in your nothing box, for those of you who were in there last week, you need to be journaling. You need to be writing it out. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? What are your disappointments? What do you feel like you're missing? And then pray, God. Right? But either way, be mindful of inappropriate relationships. Third thing that we see in this text is that Jesus was bringing her a new understanding of her status. A new understanding of her status. Not just in relationships, but in the community. Alright? So he is having this conversation with this woman. And women during, during Jesus' time, there was even a debate as to whether or not women even had souls much less intellectual capacities, right? So Jesus is already defined the odds when you look at this passage. He is engaging in an intellectual conversation with a woman, and not just any woman, a woman of ill repute, right? I mean, there's probably a reason why she passed by several streams of water and coming in the middle of the day to avoid me, right? But he's engaging her. She's asking questions. She's using critical thinking skills. This is an intellectual conversation. He's using metaphors. Some of we still don't get it, right? But he's engaging her intellectually, right? Why? Because she has shown signs that she has seen herself as beneath or less than. Her sense of worth is misplaced. Her sense of worth is this place. <laughs> now if we are in relationships and we have said that God is enough and God is our core, that we are whole, right? Because there will be people who never get married, right? Who have to have the intellectual capacity to live their life and make decisions, right? Marriage is not something that happens for everyone, right? So if we are in a relationship, it's going to be very difficult for us to be in a healthy relationship if one of those people is seen as beneath or less than. Now, when I say equal, we're talking about equal work, equal ca 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 capacity for intellect. It doesn't mean that the roles in a relationship are the same, right? There are differences. There are differences in physicality. There are differences in gifts, right? There are differences in experiences. So differences, though, do not mean that someone is beneath or less than, right? And so the question may be rising in your head, well, then what do we do with passages like Ephesians 5, where, where the scripture says that, you know, um, the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church? Well, Dr. John Kenny, who is the dean of the Virginia Union Theological Seminary in Virginia, and he's been a pastor for many years, taught a course to ministers. And in this course, he taught on this passage, and he says, now, when we look at this passage, he says there's several ways that we can, we can interpret the word head. Right? So one interpretation of head from the Greek is, yes, to lord over, right? He says, but another interpretation is 
is a military term, which means to go before, right? To go before, especially in times of danger, right? To be this, this line of defense for a family, right? This discernment, right? This I see, let us now do, right? This type of thing. And he says, this is more aligned to scriptures in Old Testament and New Testament in terms of how God reveals himself, but also if you pay attention to Christ and the church. In Ephesians, that's Ephesians 5. In Ephesians 6, what does the scripture say? It says, put on the whole armor of God. In times of what? Spiritual warfare. Right? So there is this, this sense of defense. And he says, furthermore, look at Christ with us. When has Christ ever lorded himself over? Emmanuel means what? God with us. He invites us what? Into friendship with him. He says, I inherit, you inherit the kingdom with me. Right? And so what this means, brothers, is that, you know, this requires a whole lot of humility. It, it really does. Because if you're going to love, you know, a mate or a spouse as Christ loved the church, that means you love that person to the extent that you are willing to die for them lay down your life. You're willing to deny your own needs in order to cover theirs. But sisters, we gotta be humble too. Don't play. <laughs> Dr. Kenton Sparks, provost of Eastern University, teaches in Palmer's Theological Seminary, says, look at the Genesis passage, you know, Jesus, God says, I created, you know, we create one, the woman who comes to help me for the man, right? He says, help me again, does not mean beneath, but beside. Right? He says, and how do we know this? We know this because the same word that is translated helpmate in Genesis is the same word translated later in the Old Testament to describe God in relation to humanity. And we would never say that God is less than us. Right? But helpmate, you walk beside, you support, you protect, you watch. Right? And if you look at all of these Old Testament relationships, right? Zipporah and Moses, right? You see this woman nudging and, and, and pushing and supporting right? Her husband. But that requires a humility. Why? Because we are to submit one to the other as unto the Lord. Yeah. Andy Stanley would say, it's hard to be in arguments when you submit one to another as unto the Lord. No, no, let's do it your way. No, 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 no. Let's, let's do it your way. No, 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 no. no, 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 no. <laughs> but that requires humility. And it requires an understanding that there is a worth and a value that God has given us that has nothing to do with this relationship. You cannot be humble and submissive one to another as unto God unless you are secure enough to know where your worth and value comes from. We don't ever want to put ourselves in a position where there is someone between us and God because we are beneath him. Nor do we ever want to put ourselves in a position where we are between someone and God because we feel like they're less than us. I hear in this discourse with Jesus and this woman Jesus probing her to ask, did you cross over into a line because you did not understand your worth? Did you begin to worship these men <coughs> as you should only worship them? Jesus said, God is looking for people to worship him in spirit and in truth. It is not a coincidence that he says this in this passage and in this context. He was saying, you are stepping into dangerous territory. Give it to somebody else, which you should only be given to what? The one Lord of your life. The one true God in your life. One final thing. We'll wrap it up. As we look at a change in status, this understanding of value, of work, and placement in relationship, it means that this kind of change requires a change in your actions. I can only imagine that after this encounter with Jesus, she probably stopped passing by streets and walking away and close to her, avoiding both, right? Something happens internally. But there's something else happening culturally. A lot of times women depended upon men for their financial stability, right? And so if it wasn't, if they weren't married, they depended on a husband or a family member, or an uncle or a brother, right? Somewhere along the line, she got mis, um, disconnected, right? And I can only imagine that these men that she was with on a continuous basis were probably providing financial stability for her. So this now raises a question of her having to deal and look at her finances from a different perspective. 
Now, I think this is just important for us because finances is such a big issue for relationships. Big. Amen. Now, if you are married and you want to be married and you are not on a budget, I just want to make a suggestion that you might want to get on a budget. It doesn't mean, I don't believe that you have to have all of your debt eradicated before you get married, right? Otherwise, you might be waiting a very long time. <laughs> but there has to be some level of discipline and understanding that you will not always just be able to spend whatever you want to spend. You're getting in this mode of understanding that if I'm going to be connected to another, then everything I do affects me. So if you're single, get on the budget. Start being a better manager of your money. If you're married, <laughs> share <laughs> about your finances. But really share about major, major decisions and purchases. Like don't come home and be like, oh baby, I bought a party. You did what? <laughs> what account did you do? <laughs> Why? Because finances still is a major factor in many divorces today. It's one of the leading factors, disagreements around money. Now I know that there are people who leave because of money, but there are also people who stay just because of money. So this is something we have to pay attention to. But above everything else, we got to be able, wherever we are, to leave space for God to come in. Because if God isn't coming in, we are not going to be able to sustain and stay in healthy relationships. If you are wondering whether or not God is enough for you, and you're not married yet, I would challenge you to go ahead and learn what it means to be comfortable with yourself and with God. Amen. Instead of hanging out with your friends all the time, get comfortable going out eating by yourself. Go to the movies by yourself. Oh, oh, I don't want to scare anybody. Right? But you don't want your sense of happiness so connected, right, to another that you aren't free to be who you are in God. Now, if you're married, and you didn't do this before you got married, it's okay. You know, don't start backpedaling talking about I need to do me before I can do me. <laughs> that is a privilege of single people. But maybe you want to mutually on agree on some personal time each week. And then come together and talk about what you are learning and how you're growing in God during that personal time. Right? Because at our core, we need to first be about God. And if we can't do that, we're not going to be able to be at anything else. Now, relationships can be great and they can be beautiful. If we're putting in the work and if we are trusting God to be redemptive in that. Because when reality hits, things can get hard, whether you're single or married. But if God is in it, we can do this thing. And then we can begin to see the strengthening of our families. We can begin to see the strengthening of our communities. We can begin to see the strengthening of our nation, of this world. Right. Coming from this nucleus and growing out. So if you're willing to put in the work, God is willing to say, we can roll with this.